Majesty. How you doing, Your Majesty? Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. It's 7 p.m. Monday, May the 2nd. Certainly want to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for a silent meditation, please. Thank you. We'd ask Councilman Davis if he would lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. Councilmember Reese. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, we have several resolutions and proclamations to present this evening. Uh, the first is presented to Tika Dempson. She would join me. Uh, this is Children's Mental Health Awareness Day proclamation. How you doing? Okay. And I won't read all the proclamations, but it speaks to the fact that to promote, promote awareness of positive mental health, well-being, and development for all children, youth, and young adult ages, birth through 26 years in North Carolina. Whereas leadership in Durham, North Carolina recognizes that mental health needs and treatment be on par with medical needs and treatment. It speaks to the fact that whereas available school-based mental health programs and positive behavior interventions and support should be considered as best practices and be encouraged to be practiced in every Durham, North Carolina public schools. Whereas children are recognized for having unique needs for recovery of mental health, emotional, behavioral, and substance abuse issues, and not being combined with adult mental health population for treatment. Whereas effective mental health treatment services to strengthen families, youth leadership development, and family partner peer supports results in children and youth overcoming trauma, becoming successful in contributing Durham, North Carolina citizens, and a safe environment in their homes, schools, and communities. 
Whereas the city of North Carolina, Mayor William B. Bill, Bill North Carolina Mental Health Planning, the Advisory Council, National Federation of Families for Children, Mental Health Alliance of Behavioral Health Care, naming North Carolina, North Carolina Families United, North Carolina State Children's Collaborative, and the families and communities who have children, youth, and young adults struggling with emotional and behavioral health issues, join to recognize Children's Mental Health Awareness Week and safety. And now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 2nd, 2016, as Children's Mental Health Awareness Day in Durham, and urge all the citizens to take special notice of this awareness and witness my hand, Corporate City of City of Durham, May 2nd, 2016. And I'm going to present this to you for any comments. Now that's a new one where people couldn't hear me, so. <laughs> Again, I'd like to thank the City Council for their continued support of families and our children and our systems of addressing mental health and behavior challenges. It's a wonderful day when the door is open to provide families an opportunity to remain employed because their employer understand that when they leave to go to school, it's just not just some, something that's made up. We've also opened the doors for our medical facilities to ensure that the appropriate staff is being hired, as well as our illustrious police department, who you know, our CIT officers are phenomenal. They have done so much to help support our community. So if you ever question are there any good things happening in Durham? I promise you they are. Thank you. The next, next recognizes National Drinking Water Week. Uh, Lee Lamb, operators at the Williams Water Treatment Plant. And we have certificates to present also, so let me briefly read this proclamation. It speaks to the fact that whereas water is a basic and essential need of mankind and whereas our health, comfort, and standard of living depend upon an adequate supply of safe, clean water, whereas throughout the years the city of Durham has taken a lead role in source water management and protection as well as production of a consistent supply of high quality drinking water, whereas our drinking water and water resources are undervalued, whereas we are all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, Whereas dedicated individuals and organizations such as city employees, industry leaders, scientists, environmentalists, and students have made significant contributions in developing, operating, and maintaining our water treatment and distribution systems, protecting and conserving this precious resource and in educating the public on the value of this resource. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 1 through May 7, 2016, as National Drinking Water Week in the city of Durham and urge all citizens to join me as a partner in the Water Use It Wisely campaign and to pledge to embrace a water conservation ethic in order to extend the life and protect the quality of our most precious natural resource. Again, with my hand, Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the second day of May 2016. I'm going to present this to you, and I know you also have some certificates. Oh, well, I didn't realize you were people. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, my name is Lee Lamb. I'm a certified operator at the Williams Water Treatment Plant, and I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Water Supply and Treatment Division and all of water management. As you know, producing clean and safe uh, drinking water is a 24-hour, uh, seven-day a week, 365-day a year commitment from our staff. We work every day to make sure that when our customers turn on the tap, they're getting a clean and safe and high quality water flow. This requires teamwork throughout the departments. It's, it's not only the certified operators, it's the distribution system, uh, the lab analysts behind the scenes, the chemists, the conservation staff, the engineers, and the managers. They're all committed to protecting and preserving the precious natural resource of water that we have uh, well into our future. And we thank you so much for recognizing the vital role that safe drinking water plays in all of our lives and we appreciate the support and the continued support of the city council and the city uh, administration 
Thank you. And we're... I think now we're going to transition into giving out some poster awards um, sponsored by Water Management. Good evening. Uh, as part of the city's annual celebration of National Drinking Water Week, the city's uh, Department of Water Management always sponsors an annual water conservation poster contest. And tonight we are uh, very proud to uh, present the award-winning poster contest winners with their certificates. So we're going to start with our uh, K through 2 division. And in third place from Kestrel Heights Elementary is Leah Clark. In second place, Avery Perkins. And in first place, unfortunately she can't, she wasn't able to join us tonight, is Grace Pressinger from Creekside Elementary. Oh, she's here. I'm sorry. Surprise. <laughs> and in our three through five category, in third place is Mackenzie Harver. Har look, excuse me. Sorry, the wrong, wrong uh, age group. Third place was Allison Hall from Durham Academy. In second place, Siomara Rivera Soria from Bethesda Elementary. And I don't think she's here. And in third place, Allison Hall from, or excuse me, in first place, Ama Mensa Boone from Durham Academy. In our six through eight division, in third place, Mackenzie Harvey from Voyager Academy. In second place, Lauren Steiner from Voyager Academy. And in first place, Amy Rosie Scott Benson, also from Voyager Academy. So all of these winning entries were represented Durham in the statewide competition. And what some of our uh, winners up here don't know is we also have some statewide winners, which continues our streak of winning uh, at the statewide every year as well. So in second place in the K through two division, Avery Perkins. And in first place, Grace Pressinger from Greek Side Elementary. <laughs> Winning at the state level in the three through five division is in third place, Allison Hall. In second place, Siomara Rivera Soria from Bethesda. And in first place, I'm Amen Saboon from Durham Academy. And in the sixth grade division, we also have some statewide winners. In third place, Mackenzie Harvey. In second place, Lauren Steiner. And if you haven't guessed by now, in first place, Amy Rosie Scott Benson from Voyager Academy. So it 
congratulations again to all of our winners. The winning posters are on display in the lobby and are also uh, displayed on the city's website. Okay. Thank you. I don't know who's going to accept this. I might accept this myself. This is about Old Americans Month. <laughs> Everybody can stand up for this, right? Huh? <laughs> I don't know if anyone's here to. Is someone here? Oh, okay, great. Well, you can say. How you doing? She doesn't qualify, right? Huh? <laughs> Whereas the city of Durham includes a community of old Americans who deserve recognition for their contributions to our nation, whereas Durham recognizes that older adults are trailblazers, advocating for themselves, their peers, and their communities, paving the way for future generations, and whereas Durham is committed to raising awareness about issues facing older Americans and helping all individuals to thrive in communities of their choice for as long as possible, whereas we appreciate the value of inclusion and support in helping older adults successfully contribute to and benefit from their communities, Whereas our community can provide opportunities to enrich the lives of individuals of all ages by promoting and engaging in activity, wellness, and social involvement, by emphasizing home and community-based services that support independent living, and ensuring community members can benefit from the contributions and experience of older adults. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Older Americans Month in Durham. Hereby urge our residents to take special note of this observance by recognizing the Durham's Park and Recreation Department for their commitment and dedication to the old Americans living in our community, and for their planning of the many events commemorating May as Old Americans Month. And with my hand, the Corporate Seal of Durham, North Carolina, this is the second day of May 2016. And I'll present this to this younger old American. <laughs> Um, thank you, Mayor, and as well as City Council members. Um, my name is Deirdre Spellman. I am the Special Programs Inclusion and Mature Adults Recreation Manager for Durham Parks and Recreation Department. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about our Durham Senior Games. They kicked off last week, um, April the 18th. And we actually broke another record this year when we had 208 registrants for the pr program and the sports that we had. Um, we <coughs> Excuse me. We have 208 people registered in a variety of different sports at a variety of different locations. I definitely like to thank the Durham Parks and Recreation staff for helping out with that program, and especially a special thanks to our Mature Adults Program coordinators Bridget Robertson, Michael Honeycutt, Christian Dixon, and William Jeanette. And I would also like to welcome you all to come out to our closing ceremonies, which will be Thursday, May 5th, at the Durham Center for Senior Life. And that starts at 5.30 and ends at 7.30. Again, thank you all so much. This last proclamation recognizes Police Week, Peace Officers Memorial Day, and I'm not sure, Chief, are you going to bring this up? The proclamation reads, whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day, and the week in which it falls on National Police Week, Whereas the officers of Durham County law enforcement play an essential role for safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Durham. Whereas it's important that our citizens are aware of and understand the dangers and problems encountered and the duties and responsibilities incurred by the law enforcement officers. 
where it is equally important that our law enforcement officers recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting them against violence or disorder, and by protecting the innocents against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation, whereas the men and women of Durham County law enforcement unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 8th through May 15th, 2016, as Police Week and April 29th, 2016, as Peace Officers Memorial Day in Durham, and call upon our citizens to join and commemorate the law enforcement officers, past and present, who have rendered a dedicated service to their community. I encourage our citizens to attend the Peace Officer Memorial Day on April 29th, which was just passed, at Greystone Baptist Church, and to honor those peace officers who have lost their lives and have become disabled by the line of duty. And with this my hand, Corporate Civil City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 29th day of April, 2016. I'm going to present this to Chief Smith and for any comments that you may have. Thank you. I want to thank Mr. Moffitt, um, Mayor Pro Tem, and, and Mr. Reese for attending. I know your schedules are busy, and I know everyone one can attend, but thank you for helping us honor and never forget our officers who paid the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. And I, and I, must, I must say here that whenever we receive this, I always remember Mr. Clement, Mr. Howard Clement. He, until he just physically was not able, he never missed a service. And we've never forgotten that in the law enforcement community. So thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Captain Robert Gaddy. I'm the Vice President of Fraternal Order Police. And again, uh, to the Durham City Council members, thank you all for your continued support of law enforcement. To the city, thank you for your continued support of law enforcement. This service is very special to us. This is the 30th year that we've had the opportunity to remember these men and women that have offered and have gave their lives in the performance of their duty for our safety. And so it's a special time for us. We also, it's a chance for us to let the families know that we'll never forget their sacrifice. Um, this year we had to move the service up a week due to the state service being um, held, would actually be this Thursday uh, at 11 o'clock in Cary. And I actually sent you all an email for that um, and an invite as well. And hopefully next year we'll be back on schedule to have our service, which is normally the first Friday of every month, but there again, due to the state service, we had to move it up. But thank you for your support, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in future events. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight. We have sometimes difficult meetings and sometimes good meetings and it's a good meeting when we can honor the work that all of the young people like y'all are doing so thank you for coming Comments by many members of the council. Recognizing the approach him. Uh, I am. Uh, uh, some of us attended the uh, funeral. Some of us attended the funeral of Angela Langley today, and it was a beautiful celebration. I would like to offer a motion that we do a resolution memorializing her. The big. Uh, Thing that we do for people. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. On April 28th, uh, the Durham Public Schools uh, Board passed a resolution in support of black boys and young men 
I have that resolution and I would like to offer that we do a resolution similar to this in support of black boys and young men. <coughs> Was that a motion or a second? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. <clears throat> I appreciate that. I think it's great. Um, can you, you said something similar to it. Do you, you, can we have something maybe by the work session to see or? Yeah, I will have the, I will still, I'll have a copy of it. Okay. Or Excuse me. Would, I'll have a copy of that. Or, or would you prefer a general motion in support of the uh, resolution or? Well, that's, that's fine. Whatever you feel comfortable with, as long as we are supporting um, the lives of totally black boys and young men. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? If not called a question, Madam Clerk. We open the vote. Open the vote. It passes seven to zero. I don't know what doing here. Are there any other comments by members of the council? recognize the city manager for any prioritizes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I don't have any priority items, but I do want to take a moment of personal privilege to uh, recognize our uh, newly appointed uh, chief of police, Sarah Lynn Davis, is in the, uh, uh, with us this evening uh, in an unofficial capacity, but here is an observer. Recognize the city attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in that case, we will proceed with the agenda as. Mr. Mayor. Recognize, I'm sorry, recognize the council member. No, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, since we welcome um, Chief Davis, chief in Atlanta, soon to be chief here, I, I wanted to say, I know that the Mayor Pro Tem and you were both at the press conference today, but for those who weren't there, I wanted to say that um, I was very impressed with your openness, with your lack of defensiveness, and with your straightforward uh, discussion of the issues, some of them very difficult. So uh, I took that to be a great sign for um, community relations in general uh, moving forward. Uh, the consent agenda consists of items that may be passed with a single motion. If a council member or member of the public asks for an item to be removed, we'll remove that and discuss that later in the meeting. I'll read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the Durham Planning Commission appointments. Item three is the mayor's nominee for appointment for the Recreation Advisory Commission. Item four is boards, committees, and commissions attendance reports for the period January 1, 2015 through December 31st, 2015. Item five is the half penny tax for parks and trails performance audit, March 2016. Item six is FY 2016-2017 water and sewer rates. Item seven is FY 2016-2017 water and sewer capital facility fees. Item nine, item eight is the bid report for March 2016. Item nine is design construction contract with Barber Design Bill for the fire station number 17 project. Item 10 is Omnisource Southeast LLC hauler for white goods for the city of Durham. Items 13 can be found on the general business agenda. Item 19 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. So second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Open the vote. And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. We move to the general business agenda. Item 13 is 2016 first quarter crime report presentation. Recognize Chief Smith. Good evening. 
Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Ladies and gentlemen of council, my name is Larry Smith and I am the interim chief of police. I'm here to present the first quarter crime report of 2016. The, the crime report consists of part one index crime. That's a total of property crime and violent crime. Part one index crime was down 12% in the first quarter. That was driven by decreases in larceny, burglaries, and aggravated assaults. Reported homicides, rapes, and robberies, and motor vehicle thefts were up. And as I go through these, we'll have some numbers to go along with it at any point as I go through. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me as, as we go through. Part one, violent crime. Part one, violent crime consists of homicides, rapes, aggravated assaults, and robberies. Violent crime is up 7% in the first quarter of 2016 driven primarily by an increase in robberies. I'm sure you all remember at the, the last quarter of 2015, what we were dealing with mostly was aggravated assaults and homicides. And you are aware that we put together an operation. What we did, we had every investigator who had a homicide or a robbery, and we included our intelligence unit, and we went through every one of those cases, case by case, looking at both suspects and victims. And 19 particular individuals rose to the top of that that had, had either been suspects in multiple cases or victims or both and we put together an operation and we targeted those 19 individuals who had been involved in that to include submitting their names to some of our community partners like cjrc and project build and some others for an opportunity if they wanted to come out of that lifestyle to do so and that has been very successful of those 19 um, four i think are in federal custody about 13 of them have been arrested um, one of them did take advantage of those services in the last I heard. He's working with a plumber and doing quite well. So, you know, I got to ask, it, was that successful? Well, for that, I think it was. Uh, what, if we measure success by crime, violent crime did exactly what we wanted to do? No, but, but as far as those 19 that were actively involved in violence at that time, I think we had some success. Uh, we have since done that again. Last month, we did the same thing. We took and we, we looked at all of our aggravated assaults, our homicides, and this time 23 unique individuals came up. However, six of those were carried over from the original 19. Uh, we have repurposed the heat teams and all of our proactive units to try to deal with those issues. I think that's resulted in a decrease in the, in the aggravated assault, which we'll, which we'll go through shortly. Uh, unfortunately, what is driving us this time is robberies. And we've also been trying to address those as well. These are the numbers that correspond with the, ag with the violent crime. Homicide is up 10%. We've had, we had 11 by the end of the quarter. Uh, rape up 35% with 23. Robbery, 192, up 22%. And aggravated assault, down 2% for a violent crime increase of 7%. However, as of the last crime report I got of April the 23rd, at that point, homicide was up 27% rape 47 percent but let me mention this with rape rapes are, are low numbers so it doesn't take a lot in the numbers to affect the percentages typically over the last three years our rapes have run almost the exact same number so uh, robbery has dropped down to 15.8 percent from 22 percent and aggravated assault has decreased even further to 3.3 percent down for a 4.9 percent increase in violent crime which come down a little bit from the seven percent increase that you see uh, the, the robbery issue, we, we continue to have some of the same problems that we had actually all of 2015, and that is our Latino population seems to be uh, particularly targeted. Um, we have put together several operations for robbery, robberies. If you look in your summary, you'll see multiple arrests that we have made. And we've had every proactive unit, our heat teams, our special operations division, our tactical teams out dealing with these problems, uh, either working on the 19 and now the 23 or trying to do high, high um, visibility surveillance or covert surveillance in the areas where we're having the robberies. And, and we've had some success. Uh, the robberies have decreased a little bit uh, number-wise, uh, including recently our CID unit, which their task was actually investigating these crimes after the fact, over in District 3 where Captain Gaddy is, is the captain. That unit decided to go out. Uh, we had a, a Hispanic couple coming back from church. They, it was an armed robbery. They shot him. And based on that and the fact they'd had some others in that area, they did some surveillance. Uh, they heard some gunfire, and indeed it was another robbery where they robbed and then fired, but the, the, the bullet grazed him. 
Uh, they were able to take him into custody, and, and they were cleared that one and the one previously where they shot, shot him in the stomach. So we've had some success, but we are, we're putting everything we have at trying to deal with the violent crime problem that we're, we're facing in this city. Also, last time we included some demographics. I did not include maps this time, but I will tell you we will do that on the annual report. But the mapping would be much the same. Most of the violent crime occurs down into the central most parts of the city. But we did include the demographics to get an idea of what our victims and suspects looks like, and it mirrors the report that we gave in 15. And this time, 67% of all victims were black, 17% were Hispanic, and 12%. Uh, white and then uh, one percent Asian. We, you, you may know, and we did make the arrest. We had an Asian robbery string at the end of 2015, and we have arrested four or five people on that. Um, the federal government has taken the lead in that case, uh, given the fact that it involves some businesses. So they were able to tie it into what they call a Hobbs Act, and and they're going to be taken into federal custody. And then the gender is 56 percent male and 44 uh, percent female. And then as far as suspects, and then once again, this is, uh, this is named suspects where the victim either named their attacker or we made an arrest. And the demographics of that are, and mine is, mine is really small, 86% 80, uh, black, 6% Hispanic, and 8% uh, white, and then 79% male and 21% female. And that is an overview of the violent crime in the first quarter. Do you have any questions as it relates to violent crime at this point? Chief, do we have, uh, you probably don't have it here, but if you go back to that, it will be interesting, again, well, no, to your, to your pie chart. Okay. Again, you don't have to have it here, but it will be interesting, again, to see the ages of the suspects as well as the victims. I, I guess I'm more concerned about the suspects. Uh, we, I don't have that here, Mr. Mayor, but typically what we see, as you've seen when we do our violent crime roundtable and also what we see in our gang reduction meetings, typically starting around 16, it starts to move up, it peaks around 22, and starts to come back down and levels back out, you know, in the mid-30s. And I, I would imagine that would hold true in this, but I, we can get that. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. I just can't um, wrap my what is causing this chief I am just devastated I, I wish I had an answer to that yeah. I, I don't I don't have an answer to that I mean I think we all know there's multiple causes to that yes. everything from uh, you know fatherlessness to to, mm -hmm. to to poverty to lack of education I mean all those things are some of the root causes of it you know yeah. where does it start I don't know, that's, that's a bigger question than I can answer but I know. You know, most of the time we deal with the symptoms not the causes but um, uh, typically, typically the, the 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 suspects we encounter most of the time have very similar backgrounds in that, you know, they come typically through fatherlessness and then uh, the streets have been very involved in their lives and then lack of education and all those things. That, that, that I guess I those. didn't really want you to have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew most of the answers. Yeah. Okay. Property crime. Property crime is made up of burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Property crime is down 15% in the first quarter. It's the lowest it's been in 16 years, and burglaries are the lowest in the first quarter they've been in 16 years. We've seen a 31% drop in the number of burglaries and 9% drop in reported larcenies. So that's good news. Burglary is a home break-in. That's typically what that is. And, you know, property crime actually touches more citizens in our city. Property crime makes up the vast majority of our crime although it's violent crime that gets the most attention. But property crime makes up the biggest majority of our crime in burglaries and larcenies are down significantly. These are the numbers that correspond with that. Burglary is down 31 percent, larceny is down 9, motor vehicle theft up 7 uh, for a total decrease in property crime in the first quarter of 15 percent. Uh, as of April 23rd as well in the last numbers that I have uh, that property that burglary has actually dropped down now to 33 percent a larceny is down by five so it's uh, down a little less motor vehicle theft has increased to 15 percent and property overall property crime is down 10 percent as of April 23rd uh, of this year 
but however, at the end of the quarter, our total index crime was down 12 percent. Clearance rates. We are meeting our clearance rates in all areas with exception of rape and aggravated assault for the first quarter. As you know, at the end of 2015, we had several areas where we, we did not meet it. Uh, the first quarter is not a good indicator of how you're going to do in the whole year. It's only three months, uh, and, and so there will be a lot more cases coming in the next three months before the first quarter we were able to meet that. However, we do have a target of 50 percent clearance in, in total violent crime, and as of right now, we're at 40.6 percent, so we're a little below that. We have a target of 23 percent of property crime clearance, and we're at 24.8 percent in that. So. Uh, we are meeting our target in property, but not meeting our target in violent crime for clearance rates in the first quarter. Chief, yes. <clears throat> when you talk about your targets, are you are we talking? What, are your targets on this chart? It's not, but it's the it's the six performance measures that we okay. report on, um, right. and and we report on our clearance. One of them is being our clearance rates, and we, we our target is to clear 50 percent of all violent crime and 23 percent of all property crime. Okay, thank you. Response times, uh, 6.25 a minute average response time in the first quarter. Our target is 5.8 minutes, so we have not met that target. And then also we hope to respond to 51 point to, I'm sorry, 57 percent of all priority one calls in under five minutes. But in the first quarter we were at 51.3 percent, so we did not meet that target either. Uh, I, I will say that we, do, we are utilizing the staffing that the budget office and the manager's office cleared up for us to put some additional officers out. Uh, I think it is making a difference. Uh, I, would like, I would like to see those numbers increasing even more. But um, what it, what's happening is as, as we got those officers in, as we got some of the officers out of the academy, uh, we're, we're losing on average about five a month. So in a couple months, that's, that's 10 officers that we lose. Uh, but the staff and also the staffing level, the, st the additional staffing starts on Thursday and it runs through, through Sunday. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we don't have the additional staffing out. Uh, but but um, typically prior to this staffing and prior to us getting a, um, uh, some, some recruits released out on their own, our, our um, rosters, it looked like we were running anywhere from 50 to 60 percent staffing. Now we're running high 60s to 70s. I, have, I had seen some 80s right when we first started it, which makes a big difference to the officers out there. But we're starting to see it creep back down just a little bit in our staffing levels. And then as well, just because we are fully staffed or just, just because we have 80% staffing or 90% staffing, that doesn't mean that every officer is at work. For example, tonight the, the staffing level is 70%, but each district has a, couple, a person out sick or a couple people off on a holiday. We've got some people on administrative leave. We have a couple female officers who are pregnant, so they're out on that. So there's a lot of things that affect the staffing and how many officers are actually out there doing the job. Which leads me to the staffing levels. Right now, we're, at sworn, we're fully staffed, and at non-sworn, we're 90 percent. However, uh, we do have 39 operational vacancies. That means there's 39 officers that are not uh, out there in the field working in some capacity. That is due to the fact that we have s several in some form of training. Either they're either in the academy or they're riding with a field training officer. Or since I was before you last three months ago, on average, we've lost about 15 officers due to some form of uh, whether it was retirement, whether it was leaving law enforcement, or whether it was leaving for another agency. So really a little bit challenged right now at the attrition rate and trying to catch up. And then recruiting has become quite the challenge in law enforcement, and, and, and it's, it's a struggle. So uh, it's going to be some challenges for us. We, we have gotten the ICP report. Uh, it's 285 pages. It's very comprehensive. Uh, we, we gave Chief Davis her first copy when she came so she could, en could enjoy her, the reading. And, um, it will be going through it. And, and many of their recommendations are some of the things that the executive staff had already looked at at, at some changes we thought could be, could be beneficial as it relates to this staffing. And we'll just see where it leads in the next few months. And that is it for my presentation, if, unless you have any questions for me specifically. You're going to ask Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman <coughs> Moffitt, Councilman Shule, Councilman Davis, in order. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service to the city. Thank you. You're an incredible person. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. Um, a part of that is because you're my son's 
wrestling meet. Okay. <laughs> um, are are our salaries competitive? Um, you know, we're doing, a, we're doing a salary study now. I think our starting salaries are competitive, and I think our, you know, I, I don't want to speak uninformed. Uh, I think they are competitive. I, however, I do think there are some agencies around here that are paying a little bit better. I've had several of the officers who've leave lately to come into my office because I want to talk to them and find out why, why are you leaving our organization. And, you know, pay is part of it. The last one that uh, left said that he actually left he was going to be making a little bit less but but that department's pay structure moved him up a little bit more uh, and you know there's just some concern some have left the profession altogether just because of some of the uh, negativity uh, uh, associated with the profession uh, here lately so um, but those are things we'll be looking at both with the pay study and going forward um, my last question is what now is the role of the heat team they yeah. are under the special person. operations division commander he monitors what they do, and their primary function is to deal with, to look at the previously the 19, now these others, uh, work with probation, look at associates, where they're at, where they may work, or working in these areas where we're having the robberies. So, so they are focusing, a part of what they're doing is focusing on those 19 or 23 people. That's correct. Definitely. Or their associates in the places where they frequent where there might be violence. Okay. Thank you. I want, I, thank you. I wanted to ask um, about the staffing because I noticed the two things. One, I noticed that the response times had gotten a little longer. Two, that we begin to implement overtime mm -hmm. with the in, starting in February. And three, that um, you've been able to implement 1,300 foot patrols in that time. I don't know whether, I mean, and, that's, and the foot patrols are good. That's good. We're glad to see, or I'm glad to see it. I think we all are. Is there kind of a, is that kind of a push and a pull? Like the response times are getting longer in part because of the foot patrols, or? You know, I can't say for sure. Maybe, um, you know, what we what we what we obviously when we asked for the money, we wanted to have some performance measures in there to see. One of them, we will track our response times. We haven't seen much change in that, quite frankly, in the in the three months that we've been monitoring it. But we also asked each officer, and we met with the supervisors and said, listen, can, is this a possible trade-off? You know, we want to hear from the officers who are actually doing it. And that trade-off was when they come, when a squad comes to work, the captains will pick the areas where they feel like they need the foot patrol. And each officer in a squad and in a district would do 30 minutes to an hour of foot patrol in a shift. That doesn't mean each day. That means if they've worked three days in a row, one officer off that squad in that three-day shift would get out of the car and, and walk somewhere 30 minutes to an hour. And they may do... They may pair up and do it. And they said they felt like that they, that they could do that with the additional staffing. But, you know, I mean, does that mean that that's affected? I can't say that's affected the response times. I just don't think we are where we need to be yet with staffing and uniform patrol. And, and I've been part of that. I've been part of the executive team now for, for five years, and I've said this in the last six months, and I think we're committed to it, and certainly we'll be working with Chief Davis. It is really time to make our uniform patrol division a priority. The city has grown, it's gotten busier. It's a good thing, but we've got to get our men and women who are out there running to call some, some help so they can, uh, they can get to the calls quicker and have some more time maybe to do some proactive things and some more community things. I think, I think when, if you're not careful, and I'm afraid that's kind of where we are here, when you, when you run officers so much, it, that can start to affect their morale. It starts to affect how they feel. They feel like they come in, run from call to call to call, and, and don't have any downtime, uh, and I think I think we're at that critical point with our patrol officers, and I think we recognize it as an organization. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to, I, you, know, you talked about robberies in your report. Um, I think we're all concerned by that. And you list a lot of different arrests, and I just wanted to lift one up that I was really impressed with, which was um, it, it followed on a 50-year-old woman being robbed and assaulted, and. Um, you know, they got videos of the suspect and put out a, a description. And one of your officers, Sergeant, I think it's Molay. Molay. Mm -hmm. Driving into work the next day, you know, just happened to notice somebody walking down the street. And through that, by being able, by paying attention and being alert, was able to affect, you know, make, uh, clearing that particular case. And um, I just really appreciated that kind of alertness. I, I right. can't remember somebody from one hour to the next, yeah. so I thought that was pretty tremendous. Um, and I thought 
thought there was one more thing, but perhaps not. Oh, I, yes. Um, I just I, I sent you an email today, um, or copied you on an email, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to just, and I can't remember, Chief Sarvis sent me the name of the officer, and I can't remember who it is right now, but somebody in District 2, who I'm sure didn't know who I was, but I was, uh, several of us were helping a motorist, and they stopped and helped, and the fact that they've they, they didn't have to, they did. And the fact that they were bilingual, which just helped everybody relax, because mm -hmm. then we could communicate, it was great. Um, and not only helped that person, but somebody came up on a bicycle and they, pulled, they got their car off the street, got tools out, and worked on the bike for the person. I just thought it was tremendous sort of community service, so thanks. I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, uh, I, I appreciate it also, as Don has highlighted some of the, um, the incidents that you reported on, and I appreciated reading the thorough uh, description of those. And, you know, I'm constantly reminded uh, when I read those that, you know, there are a lot of jobs I see people do that I feel like I could do. Mm -hmm. But I read this and I think, this is a job I can't do. This is a hard, hard job. And I'm so appreciative of the people that are willing to do it, have the courage to do it, because so many of those incidents really involved not just good thinking and quick action, but, uh, but, but, but courage, tremendous courage. And uh, so I just want to say that one more time. Um, in terms of the staffing, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we're anticipating that the manager will bring us a budget that includes more uniformed officers. Uh, he's told us that. Uh, we have checked it off, I would say, in our preliminary meetings, and we are looking forward, I think, to being able to support that. I know I am, and really appreciate uh, the manager for working with you all in that direction. Um, it just, again, you know, I know we've all said this, and. Uh, what, what, let me ask you this, Chief. What's, what's your retirement date? Uh, June 24th. June 24th. Yeah, that's my last day, July 1st officially, but okay. June 24th. Well, um, you know, you talked about the vacancies at, and the people leaving, and, and your vacancy will leave a tremendous, tremendous gap. Uh, you have brought such integrity and forthrightness uh, to your work, uh, and I've especially appreciated the time since you've been in the interim chief position because uh, you know, it's easy. Uh, you know, it's easy to just be a placeholder, but you've done so much more than that. You not only have you held the department together, but you've really advanced the work of the department. And I, I know that the, our whole community is appreciative of that. Um, and you're you're really you're leaving the department, uh, even just from your interim role, so much better than you found it. And I just want to wish you Godspeed and thank you and a, and, a, and a lovely retirement. Thank you. And uh, I'm and and don't hesitate to send us emails to give us advice uh, once you've retired. We'll, we'll be happy to receive them. I may take you up on that. Yeah, I know you will. <laughs> so go ahead and send them. But Chief, really, we, we're you. so grateful for your service. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chief, for the work that you continue to do, you and the entire police department staff. Um, I, I want to let you know how much I appreciate all of the openness that you all have had uh, to many of the um, issues of concern and in some cases uh, even demands that have been placed upon you by members of the community, legitimate demands and, and concerns, uh, particularly around the issue of bias and other kinds of things. You all have responded very favorably and have invited uh, people to offer uh, suggestions and even criticisms. Uh, but I hope that you will continue, even with that uh, concern for the issues that are raised, uh, will not stop trying to be ever vigilant uh, in our communities. It appears that there are lots of communities that complain about over-policing, but I also hear from lots of people in this city who want more people to patrol their neighborhoods and to make sure that their neighborhoods are as safe as any other neighborhood in the city. Uh, the, the geographic distribution of many of the crimes that we've seen uh, show that we need to make sure that we um, not target, but we certainly need to look at those areas where that crime is being perpetrated upon the citizens, mm -hmm. many of them innocent citizens uh, along the way. So I would 
encourage you and the rest of the staff to continue the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Davis. Recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you. Uh, Chief Smith, I want to echo what my colleagues have said about your service during this interim period. Um, as uh, the Mayor Pro Tem said, it would have been very, very easy for someone in your situation to uh, just kind of go with the flow, mark your time until we hired um, a new police chief, and you've done almost exactly the opposite, sir. You have uh, grappled with difficult issues. You haven't shied away from the problems that you've seen. Um, and I also, I, I really respect that, that at the same time you have raised up important and compelling stories about how our officers have gone above and beyond the call of duty. You've also been not afraid uh, to confront real issues that are facing our department. And for that, uh, our community will always owe you a debt of gratitude. Um, I did want to ask you one question about the report. Okay. Um, and that is uh, in connection with, is my microphone really loud or what? <laughs> um, in connection with the increase in robberies, do you have any sense of um, what proportion of those in the first quarter were armed robbery versus just common law robbery? I could get you that number. I think the vast majority of them were armed. Yeah. That, that was what I had feared, and I, I wonder if that has something to do with the drop in burglary, and maybe, and I don't know if you're seeing this on the street or in your reports, but are, are we experiencing an influx of firearms such that it now is easier to commit an armed robbery than it is a burglary, I wonder? Well, I, I don't know about that, but I will tell you, because I know it's an it's a issue that, that, that Sheriff Andrews took up, is a lot of the firearms come from burglaries. You know, they're breaking. That's always a, a, a hot commodity in a burglary right. firearm. And, and so, uh, but is, that, is there a connection between those two? I, I couldn't draw that. I, I, earlier today, I, I noted that, you know, I hope that our RAP, our residential awareness program, which we've had in place for a couple of years now, is maybe, maybe we're starting to see the long-term fruit of that and the fact that it's bringing bringing our burglaries down. And you've heard that, that program where we go into an area that's experienced burglaries. Uh, we notify the citizens. We do a lot of high visibility patrol, and then we monitor that for six months to see. Because you know, statistically, it shows if there's been a, a rash of burglaries in a neighborhood, it'll, it'll continue. Uh, it's a kind of predictive policing model. And I, I think it's worked. It's shown that it's. So I'm hoping maybe that's had something to do. But outside of that, I really don't know. It's probably more pop psychology on my part, trying to create a relationship where the data doesn't really bear one out. I do, I do want to point out in the report, and I don't, I don't know if you mentioned this in your, uh, in your presentation, but I really appreciate you giving us those violent gun crime initiative statistics through uh, the middle of this month. I think that's an area uh, that can make a real difference, and I saw uh, in the report that you've had 68 firearms confiscated. It does my heart good. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see that number doubled and tripled. I know you would too, um, and I hope that that's something that our uh, next chief can, can uh, focus on. Uh, as well. Uh, so I appreciate that. And just again, thank you for your service to our city. Thank you, appreciate Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Recognizing Mayor Pro Tem. Have you seen an increase in just gunshots being fired throughout the city? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't okay. know. Uh, we'd have to check that in our CAD system to see okay. how many uh, calls for shots fired that we've had. Yep. Yeah. Check that out. Okay. I know I heard eight on Saturday night okay. in my neighborhood, in, in that area. Right. So, yeah. sound like they were in my backyard, but they weren't. Right. It's hard they to tell where gunshots are coming from. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to tell. I'd like to know. Okay. Okay. Chief, I would, the good thing about being on a council like this, you have so many articulate council persons. <laughs> uh, you don't have to say much more, but say I, I agree with the comments they've made, and I, I sincerely do. I think you've done an excellent job. Thank you. Uh, during your time as, as interim chief. Uh, you haven't acted like an interim chief, and uh, we appreciate that. I, I just want to maybe go back to incidents that have occurred over the last couple of weeks in this community. And is there anything you can share with the council and the public in terms of any ties to what, I'm talking about the homicides, and mm -hmm. that, well, they won't, I, they won't jeopardize well, you. Yeah, I, I know we had the homicide on Ash Street, then we had a run of shootings. We do know there was some relation between those, and, and we're still working on that. Uh, it doesn't appear that the Broad Street homicide was related to that in any way, if that helps you. Uh, we do have some good leads on that. We're still working those. But, but you had the homicide on Ash. There was some drug turf dispute there. Some, some families and some people had been uh, disputing over that area. Uh, and then the, the gunfire erupts. You know, one's dead, no one shot, and then there's some retaliatory. And so 
uh, the rash, the run of shootings that we had last week, most of them were related to that one incident on Ash Street. Okay. How about the uh, Dearborn? Y yes, the, the, the shooting on Dearborn, uh, we don't think that sh shooting with, with the three uh, was necessarily related, but the one where they ended up in the chase at the Duke, uh, the, the wreck at the Duke at the VA, we do think that was related um, to uh, something else. And we do have a couple, you know, we got a couple in custody for that and we're looking for some others. Have you had community support and? Uh, well, I will say this, I know our District 2 staff went down to a community meeting in uh, Old Oxford because of the violence that they were very well received uh, and, you know, they were asking for more police officers and they were very pleased with our response and some of the things we've done. So uh, immediately the District Command staff did get out in front of the uh, residents out at Old Oxford and that was, I understand they had a very good and informative meeting. McDougal is quieted down or we just haven't? Uh, a little bit, but we still have some issues in McDougal, we do. We do, but we haven't had some problems that we've had at the end of 15, but McDougal Terrace still has, we still have some issues there. And the foot patrols that we've mentioned, where, where have they occurred? I mean, all, they, over. all over. They're all over, yeah. The district commanders are, are tasked with deciding where they need to be, uh, and we've asked them to do both residential and business areas uh, as they can. And, and once again, you know, sometimes if staffing's down and they're real busy, they don't, but if they have time, we've asked them. Because, you know, early in the morning is not a great time to do a foot patrol in a residential area, neither late at night. So some of the foot patrols, if they could do them a little early, they may do them in a business district when the businesses are open, you know. And, uh, but then at four or five, when that would be peak time to do a foot patrol in a neighborhood, or even six, is when you have the highest calls for service. So that makes that hard sometimes. But our heat team teams do a lot of uh, foot patrol, a lot of foot patrol. Our District 1 heat team has done a tremendous amount of foot patrol over in um, uh, Bentwood at, on Junction Road, 322 Junction Road. We've had a lot, of, a lot of the violence seems to be tying back into that area too, and they've been spending a lot of time out there trying to get some intelligence to find out what's driving some of these things. You, you mentioned that a lot of this is related to, you think is related to drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of impact are we having on drugs in this community? Are we, are we getting to the drug dealers? Are we clamping out? What, what's, what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, we do. We have quite, quite a bit of success in getting, we, we have our special operations division that works, and well, we have our federal task force that works at some of the large scale traffickers. Uh, we've had, we had a very, very large uh, drug arrest and a very large amount of money that involved a federal investigation recently. Uh, and then we, we try to look at the mid-level uh, traffickers who are su supplying the street level dealers, but most of the violence centers around your street level dealers. That, that's where, uh, you know, they've got that territory set up and that's where they make their money and you move into that and then, and then that's generally what causes violence to erupt. And a couple, couple, several of our homicides, over half of our homicides had centered around that very scenario. Well, let me tell you what I hear. I hear that as long as these guys are able to make money dealing drugs, the violence is gonna be down. When they can't make money dealing drugs, then the balance goes up. I don't know if it's any correlation there or not, but I hear a lot about, you mentioned the fact about territorial and some of these things seem to be driven by that. And that's why I was asking you, are we, are we clamping down on, on the drug dealers such as making hard for them to make money as a result, people are going where they can and causing this type of stuff? Well, we, we always try to work those areas where, where street level drug sales are prevalent. And, and it doesn't take as long to know about those areas because people call. Uh, but you know, if some if somebody's making money, somebody's not, and typically that's that's what's causing this. I'm making money here, I'm selling here, and along you come, that's not going to happen and, and move into my territory. And that, and that has also uh, what we're getting is that's increased with some of the people being released. You know, we're having we had about 600 people released from the penal system last year. It came back in just to Durham, and coming back in some of the areas where they were established before, and some of the things that we're hearing out there, and want to set back up where they were before. But now somebody else is running this now. And, and, and typically that will result in violence. Step, step out, given what you know, what you've experienced, do you see things getting any better? Wow, Mr. Mayor, that's a hard question. Um, I, I would like to think so, but, but my fear is it just seems that the, the underlying factors that, that I think drive this seem to be getting worse to me. Uh, and so that, that makes me wonder going forward is will, will this get better? 
uh, I, I think this will only get better. And I, I, you may have sensed my frustration in the last press conference when people really say enough is enough and, and get busy trying to do something with the young, particularly young men, and, and they're particularly young black men that, that seem to be so heavily predisposed to that type of violence. And um, we've got a lot of resources here. We've got a lot of churches. We've got a lot of organizations, and, and I hope that they can do that. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of the churches that I know, and, and there's a lot of people doing that. Don't, don't get me wrong. There are. There's a lot of people doing it. But and I talk to some of the, the ministries that try to do those things. They're almost tapped out. And you know our social services systems are bursting at the seams. You, you know that. You, you've seen it. Uh, so I, I don't know, uh, Mr. Mayor. I just don't know. Do I think the police trying to keep it stamped down is going to make it any better? I know we're not going to make it any better. We're not. We, we can't keep up. Um, but, but that's uh, – but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, uh, but that's, that's a, it's a big challenge. And it's just not a challenge for Durham. I think you're seeing cities across this nation deal with it. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Would so, you uh, just have your command staff stand for the police week as well? Just so we can see I'm sorry? All. Could you have the police officers who are here stand and see how many are here? here sure, if all the officers stand, it'd be great. National Police Week. So I would like to say before I leave, um, I thank you for your words. I want to thank this council and certainly your predecessors of the last 28 years for managing the city of Wales to give me the opportunity to have a fantastic job. I have have loved this profession. I still do. Um, Chief Davis said she loves her department in Atlanta. She's going to love Durham because I love Durham and I love <laughs> the men and women who do it. And um, but thank you, you know, for managing the city well and giving me that opportunity to have a, a job where I could raise a family and enjoy and enjoy life. And to the men and women of the Durham Police Department who are here and who may be watching this on TV, it's been an honor to serve amongst their ranks. I never saw myself being a, a deputy chief, much less an interim chief. But but here I stand, and it. It's been an honor, and, and I'll always feel a part of this profession when you go out. You, you, you're always a part of it, and um, they, they are very courageous, and they are a very brave bunch of people, and uh, I'm going to miss it, and I'm going to miss the people who do it, but I, I, uh, I say to you, God bless you, and um, you certainly will be in my prayers going forward. Thank you. Moved to item 19, proposed new downtown parking garage. Turn it over Good to Good evening, the Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. I'm Thomas evening. Leathers with the Transportation Department. The item we bring before you tonight for your consideration is seeking council approval uh, for the administration to continue with the current approach and timeline to deliver the new mixed use <coughs> parking garage downtown on parcel 14. And to that end, I'm here to answer any questions that you may have or provide additional information. Well, let me, since I, I was not at the work session when this issue was discussed, and I know we have several people that signed up to speak, uh, I think what I'd prefer to do is hear, hear the speakers and then get back to any conversation with the council, unless someone else on the council has something to say prior to that. If not, uh, I'm just going to call your name as they were as you signed up, and uh, if you could limit your remarks to three minutes initially, please, and we may have questions. Uh, Robert Chapman, Lou Myers, Bill Kalkoff, Larissa Seibel, and Melissa Mills. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak to and sign up on the card? If not, uh, recognize. Rob Chapman, if you could state your name and address as you come forward, please. Uh, my name is Bob Chapman. I live at 2525 Lanier Place in Durham. I am a new urbanist real estate developer with 25 years experience. Uh, been involved in projects with a couple of thousand units of housing in them. And um, I'm currently involved in Greensboro building two 
space parking decks in a mixed unit environment. And I wanted to uh, tell you when I found, about, found out about the RFP, I was motivated to think we could do more. Uh, first, I looked back at our um, last year's charrette for fixing the loop. This was the most prime spot. This was the place that uh, had more potential than any other space place along the loop. Um, then I looked at the Kimley Horn massing study uh, in the RFQ and realized that it had an area, if you look at that um, drawing uh, and see the green roof to the right, that's a roof on top of uh, proposed ground floor retail, which is a good idea. Uh, however, it's empty space above. So this is a, a drawing of uh, what Kimley Horn proposed. The green area is that roof, uh, but there's, no, there's nothing built on the top six floors above it. So we just looked at what would happen if we could put uh, six apartments there uh, at no loss of uh, spaces uh, and realized, well, uh, we w w for the five floors, that would be a total of 30 more apartments. If you did it on the roof, it actually would be 36 more apartments. Uh, and uh, then looked at the budget. This is a close-up, uh, ample sized. Um, and uh, then we did a few drawings. Uh, these are just massing studies showing what it would look like compared to what it looked like uh, in the Kimberly Horn massing study, which uh, w was open plates, perhaps with some skin to hide the plates, but nothing above the ground floor. So this would be looking for Morgan at Rigsby. Uh, another view. We contacted one of the best designers in America, Torty Gallus of Rockville, Maryland. This is one of their parking decks at Rockville Town Center, just to give you a, a comparison. Then we looked at the price, and I've confirmed these numbers this morning uh, with Metromont. Uh, we, we actually thought, we looked at a price for a cast in place uh, if we did a um, precast, it would be substantially less than this, but there was enough money left over to build those 30 units of housing, uh, and we would still have some uh, $400,000 left for amenities and streetscape. I organized this simply out of civic duty. Uh, when you see something about to happen uh, that will last a long, long time and affect the community for a long time, and it could be done better at no cost, I think you have to do what you can, and that's what we've done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lou Myers. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm Lou Myers. I reside at 208 Rigsby Avenue downtown. I'm here this evening representing downtown Durham, Inc. I am the uh, interim president and CEO of that organization. And I want to speak in support of the council moving forward uh, on the proposal to award a contract for the design of the parking deck on surface parking lot 14. <coughs> Our parking situation in downtown is critical. Um, needless to say, the parking has not kept up with our explosive growth. The shortage of spaces is already having a negative impact on our ability to continue our robust growth. The success in bringing needed hotel rooms, businesses, restaurants, retail, commercial enterprises, and entertainment to downtown is seriously threatened by the lack of available parking. This is a crisis that cannot wait a couple of months while a study is conducted about including affordable housing in this project. And let me state here that this is not an either or, either parking or housing. Parking is critical. Housing is very, very important. Um, and DDI has supported affordable housing. We will do so in the future. Uh, we understand that diversity is a key and, and does a lot for our community. And affordable housing um, will help contribute to that diversity. So we are for uh, affordable housing. Our concern is that there are too many questions and too few answers regarding affordable housing at this particular time, at this location. Uh, however, the critical parking shortage can be addressed immediately 
uh, by moving forward with the proposed deck, uh, which the city has invested time and money in bringing to this phase. Um, bringing them on in the summer of 18 is uh, certainly better than bringing them on in the fall of 18 or the winter of 18 or 19 or 20. So on behalf of DDI, we urge you to vote this evening to proceed with uh, the development of the uh, parking garage. Thank you. <coughs> Bill Calcar. Good evening, uh, Mayor Bell, members of the council. Uh, kind of good to be back. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bill Kalkoff, 39 Westridge Drive, but I'm coming for you tonight as chairman of the uh, Durham Convention Center Authority Board of Directors. Uh, as one of the partners in the convention center, you know over the past five years, the city, the county, Spectrum Management, and the Authority Board have made significant progress in the management and financial position of the convention center, something, frankly, we can all be very proud of. During the same time period, downtown Durham has welcomed the long-needed influx of hotels. These hotels are critical to the recruitment of increased, well-paying conventions to our convention center, creating jobs and tax revenues for the city and county. Maintaining this positive trend is a uh, major fiduciary obligation of the partners of the convention center, including the authority board. Unfortunately, members of the authority board feel that this growth is in jeopardy due to the parking crisis we have now in downtown. On behalf of the board, I'd like to thank Thomas Leathers, uh, Durham's parking manager, for a very informative report to our board last Thursday on the parking situation in downtown. Simply stated, as you know, we're out of parking. Just when the future of convention business for downtown looks so very bright, we place this opportunity in jeopardy. The lack of convenient parking will hinder our ability to attract and capture business. In fact, in the last month, we've lost three pieces of business due to the lack of parking. The city administration, led by Tom Bonfield, at great cost, time, and effort, has completed an analysis of a 750 park space parking deck with 15,000 square feet of retail and office space on the lot 14 surface parking lot. If this process is allowed to move forward, the deck can be ready to go in the summer of 2018. Recent discussions of the council have addressed the important issue of affordable housing as a possibility to include in the building of this parking deck. As, as our board understands, and as Lou had said, adding an element of affordable housing to the deck will require the city administration to go back uh, to the drawing board and start the process to design and build a parking deck all over again. At best, this decision delays a parking deck from coming online until 2020. Let me be clear, as Lou said and I agree, this is not a debate between parking and affordable housing. We all know we need to do both. Currently, the city has received an important consultant report about how the community should address the issue of affordable housing. For example, questions in front of you. Do we focus on 30% of median income, 60%? Do we focus on rental? Do we focus on home ownership? The Authority Board applauds the Council for addressing these affordable housing questions. Unfortunately, we do not have the answers and public policies in place at this time to begin solving this critical issue. And we do have a critical parking issue that needs resolving yesterday. The Authority Board is of the opinion we cannot afford a two plus year delay in addressing the crisis in parking downtown. We recommend that the Council proceed with all due haste to develop Lot 14. Thank you. Welcome. Larissa Seibel. Good evening. I want to speak in support of affordable housing and housing uh, for um, working workforce housing downtown, which is the way I see this proposal at 80% of area median income. I don't think it should require a subsidy from the city or any special policies or procedures. I would hope that this will be considered, that uh, you ask the staff to look at is the proposal to add affordable housing or any kind of housing um, physically possible on this site. And we hope that you will look at every city-owned property 
um, from this point forward as an opportunity to increase the diversity of downtown and to include housing for workers and for others who come and want to live downtown. It's an extremely desirable place to live. There is extremely um, limited affordable housing. I know because I looked for housing for um, working people around downtown and, and could not find any. And you know um, you, you get the calls too. I do um, want to say that I am representing the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit, although we didn't really get an opportunity to discuss this. Um, we have policies to encourage you to use your land um, to, for affordable housing for every opportunity as well as to preserve affordable housing um, in the neighborhoods around downtown. And so we look forward to working with you and hope we have an opportunity to talk about this as an opportunity for housing downtown in the future. Thank you. Melissa Mills. Good evening, council members and mayor. I'm Melissa Mills. I live at 1009 North Driver Street. And I have come here because I'm interested in affordable housing and I'm interested in parking. I'm interested in the welfare of the city. I'm for both. What I worry about is I worry about making decisions in haste, driven by fear. And that's a little bit what I'm hearing. That, and I, I certainly agree with, with the comments that have been made earlier about the dangers to lost uh, revenues in hotels because of lack of parking spaces. I had the privilege of being at the working session of the county commissioners this morning and heard that in this past year, 300 people, visitors, have been turned away from the North Carolina Museum of Life and Science because there wasn't enough parking. And so there's a lot of discussion of can there be shuttle buses, can there be this or that. There might be some creative solutions. What I'm worried about is I'm worried about the opportunity cost of taking some real estate that is really right downtown at a time when we're trying to add density to the city for the light rail. And this would be just a prime opportunity when we talk about affordable housing, we are also talking about affordable housing for young entrepreneurs who just add life to the, light, to the nightlife downtown. And affordable housing, as um, Larissa mentioned, would be something that added apartments that were livable for these young entrepreneurs that we are attracting from all over the country. So I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I'm saying that the difference of two months in 2018 isn't, that's already we have the problem between here and 2018, we've got to come up with a solution. We can't wait for 2018 to solve this. So what I'm suggesting is that we move ahead and come up now with a solution of shuttle buses, remote parking, something, free valet parking, um, and, and look again at what could we do to add density of affordable housing at no cost to the city at this very attractive location. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let, let me ask again, is it anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't had a chance to, to speak? Okay, this, this is not a, well, it is a public hearing to a certain extent. Let's come back to council unless uh, administration has something you want to add. Okay. Questions or comments from the council person? I recognize the mayor pro tem. I have a question for the attorney. Um, uh, Mr. Chapman's company has submitted um, on this project, how, how could we um, include that proposal without allowing the others to have the opportunity to respond the same way? Will we have to go back out again or? Speak, speaking off the cuff, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, uh, you wouldn't necessarily just take Mr. Chapman's proposal, but you would, you would come back and start start the process 
over again, be more inclusive uh, okay. as opposed to, I think the direction that you're getting and the manager can speak for himself is that you're, you're, you've are you been given a proposal of, of the direction that the uh, administration is going and they want guidance from you as to whether to continue on in that direction. Yeah. Um, so if you're gonna take pieces of a different proposal, you would be talking about- Going back I, Essentially starting over, yes. Okay. Okay, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Councilman Reese. So just to be clear, um, the, the RF, the, pro, the request for proposal went out. We've received proposals from various vendors to build this parking deck, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Was one of them the group that Mr. Chapman was discussing tonight, or is that, is that just extraneous to the process? No, one of the proposals received was from the Torty Gallus uh, group that Mr. Chapman is referring for the design RFQ. Okay, and the proposal that they put forward, did that include the residential units that Mr. Chapman discussed tonight? It included approximately 25 to 28 uh, residential units in their proposal. Okay, but did it otherwise meet the requirements that were in the RFP for the parking deck itself? That it did not. Um, the team of eight, seven independent uh, reviewers uh, reviewed all of the, all eight of the proposals against the established criteria as it was, was outlined in the scope of work. Um, one of some of those criteria were around the qualifications of those firms to build a cast-in-place post-tension parking garage that was misused. So we were very specific in that. Um, it was not that the RFP team was biased against affordable housing. The affordable housing component was not one of the elements that we were scoring the proposals against. So if the respondent firm would have addressed and would have demonstrated their, cap their capabilities and capacities to deliver, affordable, uh, to deliver a parking garage, we could be having another conversation because we would have viewed the affordable housing element as a value add to the proposal. So it scored low because it did not meet the basic foundations of the scope of work. Can you I don't know if you have, can you help me understand how they failed? Like what, what specifically did they not do or did not have the experience to do? Sure, um, all of the all the proposals were, were pretty much qualified. I will have, I don't have the dele delineation of the exact rankings with me tonight, but we can provide that to council. Uh, some of that would be delivery of a mixed-use parking garage of a certain size in certain municipalities with a commercial and office component to it, be it uh, a cast in place garage. So then we had other criteria that, that cascaded down from that that I can share. And so even though the, so they were qualified, but they just, they didn't, they weren't, they didn't match up to the they other They weren't the most qualified, correct. They were not the most qualified. Correct. And you indicated that an affordable housing component would be a value add on top of that. Right, we did not have any criteria or measurements to judge or to rank or evaluate an affordable housing component because that was not in our original scope of work for the garage. So in order for us to be able to have that type of capacity as a team, we would have to do another assessment to include that, which we was not a part of the original scope. Thank you. That's Councilman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thomas, you talked about two different, at the work session, you talked about a couple different types of garages and th there was a type of garage that we awarded the, that you're recommending that we award the RFP to yeah. or the contract to, mm -hmm. as opposed to the type of garage that this group was planning to build. This, build, th this, this group has offered to build a much less expensive garage and I wonder if you could talk about the differences between those two. Sure. Um, in the original scope of work, we wanted a post-tension cast-in-place garage uh, versus a uh, pre-cast garage. The difference is in the longevity of the garages. Uh, we understand the industry research tells us that a pre-cast garage, which was proposed by Mr. Chapman's group, usually have a, a life cycle of about 25 to 30 years and requires massive maintenance, preventive maintenance with the expansion joints approximately every five to seven years. We opted based on the research that we had conducted in consultation with Kimberly Horn to do a post-tension cast in place garage to give us a, a garage that could last 70 to 75 years and require less preventive maintenance in about every 10 years. Also, when we talk about cast in place garage, we looked at security, we looked at sight lines. The precast garage would give you 
little panels that would be connected by expansion joints. With each one of those panels, it also reduces the sight line. So we would have increased lighting costs, and then it, the garage would feel more closed in and not open. Um, a cast in place garage is more of a slab. So we have fewer expansion joints that are required to be connected. We have um, a better aesthetic where we can have less lighting costs. And also the visual aesthetic in the garage would be a more open canvas inside a garage. So it would be a more of an open, airy feeling of a garage. So based on, since it was being built with uh, the Parking Enterprise funds, we wanted a garage that we could put in our life cycle analysis, that we could plug the maintenance into our model and be able to project for the horizon where we could have a garage that would be durable for years to come. Thank you. You always do such a great job in describing these complicated things. I always appreciate it. Um, Mr. Mayor, just, uh, I just want to make a comment. Is it appropriate? Um, I, I'm going to vote to move this forward, and I just want to say why. I, I really appreciate, Bob, you all bringing this to us. Um, I think that um, the mayor will probably call you on you in a minute, but I can't call on you. <laughs> uh, but I will just tell you that uh, I, um, I, I appreciate you bringing this forward because I, I agree very much that uh, uh, you know that you said you're doing it as a civic-minded thing, and I appreciate that. Um, my feeling is this: it, that that subsidizing units at $144,000 a piece for 80% of the area median income isn't our target. It's not. It's not a. It wouldn't be a priority for me having nothing to do with this garage. Um, and. The thing I feel about our affordable housing, and, and, I, and I, I really feel this really strongly, and I, I wish, and I, I feel like I, I would like to have more of a discussion with our housing advocates about it, is this. We've got to keep our eye on the ball. We have, we have Liberty Street and Oldham Towers that we need to redevelop. We need to help the Durham Housing Authority do that. We need to get control of Fayette Place, 19 acres, and figure out how to redevelop it. We need to figure out how to redevelop McDougal Terrace. The, the Housing Authority is, is working on the, you know, the McDougal Terrace, Cornwallis Road, Oxford Manor, all very large projects that are all going to take tax credits. This deal is too small for a tax credit. All the subsidy would have to come from us. That's a very large subsidy per unit for a very few units and the thing that you know we, we have our whole plan we we, we have a thousand I think over 1200 units coming out of mandatory affordability this year that we need our staff to be concentrating their time on to figuring out how to keep those 1200 units coming out of affordability within the next year affordable we have very limited staff capacity both the Durham Housing Authority and in our community development department great people but very limited capacity and so my feeling is that that's what we need to keep our, our eye on, is to try to how to build that capacity and to take on those big projects. 25 units is, a, is, a, is too small for a tax credit deal. So it's all going to come from the, the, the penny. It's going to all be, have to be general fund money. And I just don't think that's a priority for our general fund money. And I really don't figure it, I don't feel it's a priority for our staff. I think our staff ought to be thinking about the things that Karen Lotto talked to us about. How do we work with our housing authority to redevelop these you know, very difficult, uh, uh, large projects on a tight timeline? Uh, rental assistance demonstration, in 2019, rental assistance demonstration is phasing out. We have three years to develop probably $120 million worth of housing authority properties. Um, the staff capacity issue is huge. And I think we ought to use it for the priorities that we know are in place. We need to use the land downtown for sure. But we have so much land downtown that is much bigger and more important than this uh, for, for the housing. We need to do those things. And so I think we ought to move this forward and continue to press forward really hard on our housing plan. I feel like we have a great road map that Karen's laid out for us. Uh, and we're going to hear a lot more from that soon, uh, set our guidelines for that. And I just think that's where our time, energy, and money ought to be spent. So I'm appreciative of this. Um, 
council, but I feel I feel uh, like it's I, I, I plan to support moving it forward. Recognize Councilwoman Johnson and Councilwoman Davis in that order. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree that we should move forward with the parking garage plan, but I um, am hesitant to completely close the door on having housing there in the future. Could we um, suggest to the uh, folks who we choose to build this garage that we would like the opportunity to build housing on it in the future, such that the garage is designed in a way that could hold housing on top of it, and that we could do that in a separate process, through a separate process at a later date so that it didn't delay the construction of this current project? Uh, that's correct. We could entertain, um, we can explore that option. Uh, that's something similar that we that we did with North Garage, be, be able to add additional levels at a later time. Um, I would caution the council that we could, that was one of the tenants of the Durham Center Garage, as well to have a mirror tower. So if we have, depending on the time element, some zoning could or some code could change in that time. But we will include that with the design firm that we select. Can I ask Councilman Davis? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like the concept that uh, Councilwoman Johnson just mentioned, uh, if that is possible. But I really think that we need to move ahead uh, as uh, has, has was the issue that was brought forth by uh, the comments from Kalkoff and Myers, Meyer, um, that we need to make sure that we get moving on this so that we don't lose any more businesses along the way because of the lack of parking and that we continue to deal with issues that would increase the um, revenues that come into the city through uh, taxes. So um, I, I would encourage the members of the council to vote to move ahead. Other I recognize, I, I have some comments I want to make, but I want, I want all the council members to speak first. Re Councilman Reese and then the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Martha. Uh, Mr. Leathers. I have to tell you that um, the idea that that we're going to build a parking deck in downtown Durham specifically for the purpose that it lasts 75 to 80 years breaks my heart. Um, we are in the midst of transforming the way that we do public transit here in Durham. And it's my hope that in 25 or 30 years, the way that people get to work in downtown Durham will be completely different. Uh, so in my mind, when you describe a choice between um, uh, a parking deck that is built to last 25 or 30 years and one that's built 75 to 80 years, the choice may be clear to you, but it's exactly, it's clear to me as well in the opposite direction. Maintenance costs, all that, the lighting, uh, understood. Um, I also think that our system of public transit as it exists today uh, could do um, more active outreach to the folks who, um, to businesses who are moving into downtown Durham who are the folks who have appealed to us? We need more parking availability, and you know I, I understand that there have been at least five instances in recent months where we've uh, been unable to accommodate requests for additional monthly parkers, and that's of course a concern. But I, I wonder what process we have in place to offer businesses like that a suite of options for their employees about other ways they can get to downtown to work, other than drive their cars and park them here for eight hours a day. Um, and more broadly, uh, I. As I said, I do think within the next 20 to 30 years, we're in the process of rapidly changing, okay, not rapidly, of changing, dra dramatic, dramatically changing the way that people move around in Durham, specifically in, as it relates to downtown. And so that's one of the things that disappoints me about this proposal. I was disappointed about it at the budget retreat, um, which was the first opportunity I had to hear about this uh, new parking deck. Um, I don't believe that I ran for this office or was elected to build more parking decks in downtown Durham. Um, uh, add to that the idea that if we delayed uh, for some period of time, and I, Lord, I hope it wouldn't take two years, given how closely the, the, the guidelines that would be necessary to add affordable housing would be to the existing, at least from a technical engineering perspective, put aside the administrative concerns about how we do that within the city government and make those units affordable. I, I don't understand and quite frankly have been unable to get someone to explain to me the two-year addition in time, but I'm not asking you the, to do that again today. You've, you've tried, you've done a great job, it's my head, not yours. Having said all that, um, I do uh, 
take to heart what my colleague, uh, Council Member Shule, has said about our need to focus our efforts where we get the most bang for our buck, where our city staff can be best focused on our goals uh, in this area. Um, and despite all the stuff I just said earlier, um, which would make great reasons to vote against the staff's proposal, I will support it tonight. Thank you. I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have different thoughts here. The first is I'm a little concerned about the idea of building a structure that will accommodate additional building in the future um, unless it's not going to add substantial costs both to the project today and to building residential in the future. Um, to me, the optimum time to do it is when we cut the site when we're, we're trying to do everything that we need to do, we, we can do it at the same time. So I want to be careful as we move forward with that, that it's a, if we, if we do move forward with um, making it feasible to build residential in the future, that it's done in such a way that it's not cost prohibitive in the future. I just don't want to add costs. But I have five major disappointments here that I want to talk about for a moment. And these are in general not directed at anybody in particular, but First is Council's made it clear that affordable housing is critical and especially downtown. And I haven't really yet, I've yet to see that really have an impact on things that are being brought to us. My second disappointment is that there's no what I'll call cross silo work. The parking deck is clearly in transportation's wheelhouse. Affordable housing is not. And there's no indication that community de development has been involved. And the result is a parking deck with required retail and an office for transportation uses. No surprise. That's what I would expect. But what we need is for um, the departments to be working across silos to figure out how to do things that are um, have a much broader impact on the community. And I will say that, I mean, I do think that I was elected to help understand, to work on what are the the issues that are facing the community and addressing those needs, whatever they are. But I think that we can do so in a way that, that makes everything stronger. Um, but we need to work across silos. The third one is, is that we, tonight, don't have any real information on which to make a decision. There's talk about a two-year delay. It's very back of the envelope estimate. We have no idea, as my colleague pointed out, what it really takes in terms of money or time. The first that we've heard about, my next disappointment is the first that we heard about it, the first that this is brought to our attention, to my recollection, is February. It's been in the works since last July. And because now we're in what's called a crisis, our hands are more or less tied. So we haven't really had the opportunity. We get to anoint it, but we don't get to really have an impact on it without doing uh, what everybody is telling us that's involved in downtown, real harm to our businesses downtown. And the crisis is our fifth disappointment, my fifth disappointment. It stands in stark contrast to the generally very orderly management of the city. Just as one example, the water department appears to work hard to forecast future demands and to stay ahead of that demand. And um, our convention center, our DPAC, uh, Bob Kloss emailed me, and perhaps all of you, but he emailed me about the impacts that parking is having on their daytime rentals. And um, we've heard um, DDI's talk tonight about that. And so we know that it's having an impact. But somewhere along the way, we failed to project what our needs were in such a way that we weren't in a crisis needing to move forward without being able to be, to bring in the impacts, I mean, excuse me, to bring in the input from council and to have a thoughtful process here. So that's, thank you. Did the mayor pro tem want to say something else? No, I'm, I'm fine. Well, let, let me um, say, unfortunately for me, uh, I was not at the work session, so I didn't have the benefit of a council discussion and uh, the, the response that I've heard from the administration today relative to what they asked for, what they got, and what was being proposed. I, I hadn't heard that information either. But I've always been a strong proponent of parking for downtown. I think if, when we had that little scenario some time ago where you were, we were asked to give our top pri priorities, uh, if you go back and check my list, parking garages was at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. 
So it's, it's not a question with me about whether or not we need parking downtown. But I, I think I've also been equally strong about affordable housing downtown in terms of mixed use. So when I, when I heard that there was an opportunity to do that, it caused me pause to try to maybe explore that a little bit better. I, I have to confess, I have, until the last week or so, I haven't heard the specifics of the critical need of parking downtown and impact you could have on some projects. I mean, I just heard that within the last week. I've heard that we need parking, but you know, some things have been brought to my attention how critical it is that we have parking in downtown uh, so that it doesn't have a negative impact on some proposed developments. But I, I still have not been totally convinced in terms of the delay uh, and the impact it would have on exploring the concept of having parking garage as proposed, uh, a level of affordable housing, and what are the trade-offs in terms of what cost it would be for that approach versus what we have. Uh, and, and when I say that, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. I mean, uh, affordable housing, this is the first time I've heard this evening we were talking about 80% medium incomes. It wasn't clear to me what affordable housing meant when Bob uh, put this proposal for. Uh, and my question is, uh, will it work for 80% medium income? Will it work for 60% medium income? Uh, the other question was, how is it going to be managed? Who would own the apartments? Would the developer own the apartments or would the city own the apartments? And I, I've heard that uh, right now we're considering doing the parking garage so it would come out of the parking fund if we did affordable housing where would the dollars come from there? And it's been alluded to that it would come from the penny for housing. Those are the level of details that I haven't got an answer to. And I think that you, we'd be in a better position if we had time to really go through and explore that. Uh, I'm not convinced that a month's delay is going to impact this garage moving forward. Uh, it's going to impact the units that are down there. But Bob, I, I reckon I'm going to recognize you. I see your hand. Trust me, I do. I see you. Uh, but I, I just wanted to lay out some of the, the concerns and thoughts that I had when I first heard about this project and still some of the, the questions that, in my opinion, need to be answered. Even if we wanted to move forward with a combination of garages and affordable housing and retail. And when I would get that tonight, uh, to me, it would take a certain amount of time to get that information. And the question is, is council willing to take that time to try to get that information and then make a decision? or do we just want to move forward with what we've got based on where we are? I, I have some other things I want to say, but I'm going to recognize you, Bob, if you, since you have raised the question. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> first, I want to address the timeline. Um, we've looked at the timeline. I, I uh, consulted with the vendor who uh, built the Columbia, South Carolina deck that was used in the RFQ as an example. Uh, from the notice to proceed, that was built in nine and a half months. Now that means that if we were able to say go, six months of which was used in ordering, and that deck, by the way, was a precast deck. On the other hand, we budgeted for a cast in place deck in the proposal we submitted. And by the way, we're not in the running for this anymore. We, we didn't make the cut. We're not looking for that. I'm trying to get the city to make a better and wiser choice at this point. The timeline would be finish it in 2017, not in the middle of 2018. And I'm absolutely certain that that is doable. That's what I do for a living. Uh, if you can wait to address these questions uh, and add a month or two and still get it done by February, that deck will be in operation in 2017, not the middle of 2018. Um, the question about precast versus cast in place, the only deck I know of around here that we have problems with is the cast-in-place deck on Chapel Hill Street. Uh, I'm not sure, and we, we had that, I went and examined it this afternoon. It's not a precast deck. Um, the income limits, there, we didn't mention any income limits in the proposal that we uh, asked um, C.T. Wilson and Torty Gallus to, to present to the city. There were no income limits mentioned. It was just to say that based on the savings that we project based on our experience, you could build these units at
at no additional cost above the $23 million. If you want to make them 30%, I'm all for it, absolutely. Um, as to management, uh, we did mention, I believe I mentioned to several of the council people that the Durham Community Land Trustees is more than willing to manage these units, and they've said they actually could pay the city back for the cost of them over time. These are all intriguing, exciting things to me, um, and uh, I'm, I'm really very, very much along, along what Charlie said. Uh, I don't think we need a 75-year deck, although every apartment developer in this area, including Berkshire, which just built the most expensive apartments ever sold in America, 269,000 each. That's a cast-in-place deck that was put up in about five, in about uh, uh, 12 weeks. Um, I, I, I don't think they wanted to build something that would not last as long as the apartments they just built. So I, I, I would tend to agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that it would make sense, and I would volunteer my service to meet with the staff and to share all the knowledge and information that I've gained. It may very well be a very simple thing of saying, let's use this airspace that we will have on the flat roof of the, down, of the first floor retail uh, and look at what the, what the cost would be. I, I truly believe that we can bring this in way below, the, or substantially below the budget and include housing units uh, that would be uh, a real asset. Thank you. Let me ask, um, appreciate your input, Bob. Let me ask the administration. If we were to ask you to go back out with an RFP for a proposal for the number of parking spaces that we, we, we've asked for, to include the retail portion that you have in there, and also to include uh, a certain number of affordable housing units, and I think we need to be very specific in terms of what incomes we're, we're talking about. Just your gut feel, how, how long would it take for you to do that and, and get a response back? Uh, from our internal discussions with our general services, and I did have a brief conversation with Reginald Johnson and community development. For us to develop that scope and do all the research, we probably would not be able to release the RFQ till early 2017, due, given our current projects that are in queue with our existing staff resources. Um, we have a lot of other programs and that, are, that we are scheduled to roll out later this year. So for us to do that research, we have to work with the city attorney's office, about the legalities around the, around the ownership of those residential units, if there would be residential units that would be for sale, if there would be residential units that would be for rent, um, how we would have to vet the management companies for those, what type of process that would be, or would it be a, a master development agreement. Um, it's a, a lot of a, a diversity of issues that we would have to navigate with and get some type of resolve and some type of uh, conformity around to be able to give an educated answer to you but it would take us months to do that. Well, that's, that's disappointing to a certain extent, but I, I can't talk about how much work you've got to do, and if that's your estimate, you're the ones that are gonna do the work. And if you're telling me you couldn't get it done until 2017, uh, I, I'd be reluctant to try to push you in that direction based on where we are. That, that just seems an awful long time for me, though. It really does. You know, it's, <coughs> Mr. Mayor, could I uh, say just sure. at this point, you know, I, I do think that uh, there are a lot of a lot of issues, a lot of very valid points that have have been raised this evening by by all parties. Um, rather than go back and, and do a, a complete forensics on how we how we got here, I think there's some some good explanations for how we got here. Some intended, some unintended. Um, I would I would like um, at least maybe a couple weeks to try to uh, think through all of these issues um, and come back to you, if nothing else, with a complete explanation of, of why it's going to take until 2017, but to see, you know, it, it, and, and better articulate uh, all of the issues that we feel that we would need to uh, have addressed. Uh, it, it's a, it is, I think it's been a little oversimplified in terms of just get it designed and get it built. Uh, but it may not be as complicated as, as others, you know, have suggested it might be. So maybe it would take two weeks, come back. Uh, I don't think, you know, certainly not going to be ready by Thursday. Uh, but, uh, and, and maybe at the work session uh, two weeks from Thursday, 
we'll try to come back with a little more explanation. I don't think two weeks is going to hurt, hurt anything in this regard. And uh, it could be a situation that if, if we can provide, you know, adequate um, uh, explanation one way or the other, you'd be in a position of taking an action at that work session in two weeks and not have to kick it all the way into the uh, June council meeting for an action. Mr. Mayor, well, would you, would that, you entertain Mayor. a motion to that effect? Uh, since this is on I, on Vineo, it would be. So moved. Second. Sure. Uh, it's been proper move and second discussion. Recognize Council Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I think it's fine to do this in two weeks. I'll vote for it. I, I just, I, in your deliberations, though, when you're thinking about this, when, when in this two weeks, uh, one of the things that will be thought about and discussed is when staff does the work on these 24 units, what work are we not doing on Liberty and Oldham? What work are we not doing on transit-oriented development, uh, you know, a zoning plan? What work are we not doing on the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the keeping the, uh, of, of that 1,200 units that are coming out of affordability affordable? I, don't, I hope that we'll think about keep think about what is the staffing needed for those things not just the parking aspect of this because I think I that think that's, that's, fair, a, Steve. that's I, 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 thank you again I, if it was simple I think we would have done it and I, I admit that you know there, there are questions I still need answered you throw out this term affordability it means different things to different people and somebody's got to pay for it got to figure out where it's coming from I, I, I completely agree with that uh, so I, I don't I don't have an issue with that I just think we ought to ourselves as well as, and I, I know the staff is doing the work, so when he throws up that number, I can't say no, it's not going to take that amount of time. But I just think we owe it to ourselves that uh, we've at least explored that, that possibility and see where, where we go from there. And if the administration uh, is willing to spend that time and come back to us in two weeks, uh, I, I certainly would appreciate it. The other piece, Mr. Manager, I think you, you might want to come back and tell us what, if you don't do this, this parking garage, what specific developments get delayed or get harmed by it? I, I think that's really important to, for, for people to understand. Any, any further questions on this item? If not, we've had discussion, called a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other items to come before the council tonight? If not, we're adjourned at 8.55 p.m.